Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's worship service. A very special welcome if you happen to be a visitor with us today. And if you're a first time visitor, we'd be delighted to be able to welcome you if you'd be willing to stand up and introduce yourself. That's not a requirement, more of a request. But do we have any first time visitors with us this morning? Okay, I'm going to jump into the bulletin and while I share a couple things with you, those of you in the pews closest to the Burgundy worship folders, I invite you to go ahead and take those out. Begin to put your information in there. Reminder inside the folders are the prayer request slips. So if you have a prayer need, fill out one of those. Hang on to it. As you leave worship today, there's a box by the front doors uh, with praying hands on it sitting on a pedestal. You can put your prayer requests in there. They'll be gathered by our prayer ministers and prayed over throughout the week. If you'd like some private prayer time with one of our prayer ministers, then at the conclusion of the service, gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. Someone will meet you there and uh, pray with you. This is the first Sunday in the church's season of Advent, so it's appropriate that I say Happy New Year to you. Um, the regular calendar runs different than the Christian calendar. The Christian calendar uh, ends the year with Christ the King Sunday, when we recognize Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the new year begins with the first Sunday in Advent, when we look forward to the birth of the newborn King. And so um, this season for us, these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, is a season of hopeful anticipation as we anticipate the birth of our Savior, but also as we find out in our reading for today, as we also anticipate the return of our Savior at the end of the age. Um, walk through Bethlehem coming up of Wednesday, November 30th. That's this Wednesday already? Wow. <laughs> Calendar's ripping right along. Um, the first performance then will be Wednesday, and then we'll have another performance uh, on Friday and Saturday. So mark your calendars for that. It's, uh, so the Christmas tree lighting must be this week as well, huh? Yeah, one of us is not keeping up with the calendar, I'll tell you that. Um, I've been asked to let you know that out in the uh, narthex there, we do have an angel tree this year. There's information about that in your bulletin. So uh, if that's something that you like to do as a tradition for your family, um, that's available to you this year. Uh, also coming up, Yule Fest. Uh, that's Friday, Saturday, December 16th and 17th at 7 p.m., Information about that in your bulletin. You guys practicing? No. Yeah. It's, it's such a talented group, right? They just, just gonna shoot from the hip, and that's what I do every Sunday, so I don't know why you shouldn't, so. Okay, Christmas worship coming up um, in the times there, typical four, six, eight, and 10. Um, and uh, we will this year because Christmas Day falls on a Sunday. We'll have a Christmas Day service, a one service at 10.30 a.m., a, a, a service of lessons and carols. So keep that in mind. Um, if, you, uh, if part of your tradition is poinsettia uh, orders or, or having a poinsettia for uh, the Christmas celebration, there's information about that in your bulletin and how to go about purchasing one. And then uh, altar flowers today given by Alice Simpson in memory of husband Jack and also by the Parish Life staff in gratefulness to God for his mercy and grace. Lots of um, other, you have anything to add? No, I, okay, I, well I saw you moving over there, so which, which is always good to see you moving. Um, so there's lots of other stuff in your bulletin, so I want to encourage you to read through it carefully and if need be, take it home with you and mark your calendar accordingly. With that, I'll invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. We'll quiet our minds, center our hearts, prepare to come into the worship of our Lord.
are captive and exiled, O God, because we have chosen our own path away from you. We are hungry for wisdom and knowledge because we have too often substituted our judgment for yours. We are lost in need of guidance. Let us come before God and confess our sins. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Forgive us and restore us. Come, Lord Jesus, guide us and deliver us. Come, Lord Jesus, teach us and renew us. Come, Lord Jesus. God, our loving Savior, has stepped in and saves us. God gives us baptism, and we come out of the new people, washed with the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus gives me life generously. God's gift restores our relationship with him and gives us back our lives. And there's more to come, an eternity of life. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Stir, Stir up, up your power, power Lord Christ, Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Our first Advent candle is lit today as a reminder that we are to love as Jesus loves us. God promised a Savior, and a Savior was born. God keeps all promises, so we watch, knowing Jesus, who loves us all, will come again. Let us pray. Help us keep the candle's light shining in our lives, Lord. We are the people who watch and wait for Christmas and want you to come to us again. Stay in our hearts this Advent season. Amen. Today's reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading for this first Sunday in the church season of Advent comes from St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. But concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as, we, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. As I said in my announcements, Happy New Year. And of course, I'm, I'm not talking about the calendar year, the one that ends midnight on December 31st. I'm talking about the church's calendar year. Um, set up some time ago by something we call the Revised Common Lectionary. It's a three-year cycle of scripture readings. So we cover much of the Gospels and that sort of thing, but also set within that series of scripture readings are the seasons of the church year. And the Christian church's calendar always ends, as I mentioned. It ends the old year with Christ the King Sunday, which we celebrated last Sunday, and it 
begins the new year with the first Sunday in Advent, this Sunday. Advent contains four Sundays, all leading up to the celebration of Christmas. It is a time of hopeful anticipation. Hopeful anticipation as we look forward to the celebration of Christ's birth. Hopeful anticipation as we look forward to Christ's return at the end of the age. Today, the first Sunday in Advent, Happy New Year. The scripture reading <clears throat> for the first Sunday in Advent always has a bit of an ominous tone to it. And the theme generally is people get ready. But it's, it's kind of like a people get ready or else feel to it. But the question is, get ready for what? And the answer is, get ready for Christ's return at the end of the age. Our scripture reading for today begins with a warning. But concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And then the scripture reading ends with another warning. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Happy New Year. I'm pretty certain that this passage of Scripture has <clears throat> nothing to do with our typical Christmas preparations. It has nothing to do with our getting ready by putting up the tree and decorating our homes, hanging those stockings by the chimney with care, buying toys for good girls and boys, and a few lumps of coal for the slackers in our life. No, we're obviously dealing with a whole different set of expectations here, and in this case, it's not really so much our expectations as it is God's expectations. So here's the most important question for us today, this first Sunday in Advent, and that question is, are you ready? <clears throat> and we're not talking about how many shopping days we have left till Christmas, but are you ready? What does it mean for us to be ready for Christ's return? And I was thinking about that as I was putting the sermon together, and another thought came to me from another scripture reading, this one from Luke's gospel. You probably remember it. Uh, there was a lawyer, uh, a, a person who understood the law, uh, the commandments of God, and, and a lawyer stood up, and he put Jesus to a test, and he asked him a question. He said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what shall I do to be ready? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How does the law read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And then he added this, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do these things and you will be ready. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I ask, are you ready? Are you ready for Christ's return? Do you have all your ducks in a row? Do you even care? Is, is it even on your radar thinking about Christ's return? And I would suggest to you that for the vast majority of people in the world, it's really not on our radar. And I suppose that's because it's going to come in an unexpected time and people have been expecting it now for thousands of years and it hasn't come, so we tend to get a little distracted by other things in life. But the question remains, are you ready? Are you ready for Christ's return? Are you sure? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Um, maybe I should remind you of the subject matter concerning that passage from Luke. Uh, the lawyer who asked the question about eternal life is about to get a, 
a, a life lesson from Jesus. And he gets that life lesson in the form of a parable. And the parable he gets is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and of course, the parable of the Good Samaritan is really all about loving our neighbor. And that whole question about who is my neighbor. Do you remember the comedy series on television, Seinfeld? You know, Jerry, Elaine, George, Kramer, and the assorted cast of characters. And do you remember the way the show ended? It was kind of a crazy end, which it seems appropriate for Seinfeld anyway. But the way the show ends is that uh, Jerry, Elaine, and, and George and Kramer end up going before a judge, and they are sent to jail. And the reason they are sent to jail is because they were in this little village, and I, I believe somebody got mugged or something like that. And, and rather than co them coming to the aid of the person who got mugged, they, they made fun of the situation, and, and they joked about it. In other words, what they did was they broke the Good Samaritan Law. Um, and so the judge sent them to jail. Now I'm not suggesting that any of you would ever be so crass as to ignore somebody in their hour of need, or that any of you would um, miss out on eternal life because you were unprepared because of your callous attitude toward your neighbor by being unwilling to show some degree of love to your neighbor as you do to yourself. However, what if being prepared for Jesus' return really did come down to what Scripture says? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you really think you would pass the test? Now maybe you're thinking, well, pastor, loving God Loving God to the best of my sinful human ability, that should be enough right there. Because doesn't Scripture say we are saved by grace through faith? And faith is loving God and, and trusting in God. So shouldn't that be enough? Wow, what's all this stuff about throwing the complexity of loving my neighbor in there? Um, because loving neighbor is, is very different than loving God, isn't it? And if that's where you are, please allow me to make you a little bit more uncomfortable. From Scripture, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. See, the bottom line here is this, and, and this is the, the part that's absolutely necessary we understand today, is that to reject your neighbor is to reject God. They are connected. They are one and the same thing. To love your neighbor is to love God. And, and the truth of the matter is, and Scripture is very clear about this, and this is the part that is um, critically important for us today, you cannot love God and hate or despise or reject your neighbor. I'm going to say that again. You cannot love God and hate, despise, or reject your neighbor. So I'm going to ask the all-important question once again. Are you ready for Christ's return? What do you think? Fact of the matter is, we have just gone through one of the most negative, contentious elections in modern history. During the course of the past few months, families have been torn apart. I saw things on TV said that a lot of families were going to have a thing on Thanksgiving where nobody could talk politics, you know. Um, political parties have been torn apart. And let's face it, if you watch the news, you figured out the nation's been torn apart as well. 
Certain amount of fear, uncertainty, hurt, anger still lingers. Still very much with us. Our nation, we are told by the pundits, is split right down the middle. I always get a kick out of uh, the winning party of a presidential election, and no matter who wins, they always say it. Um, they have now, they have a mandate. You know, and the reality is, is that you, if you ever look at the, the popular vote, it's always, almost always split right down the middle, whether they win by a large portion in the electoral college or not. Um, so my question always is, what does it take to get a mandate? You know, what, what, is, what is that mandate? And now, the reason I bring this up is, is because I'm going to twist your mind up a little bit here. I think our current social, cultural, political climate is the perfect test. It is the perfect test for Christians. It is the perfect test that will determine if we truly are ready for Christ's return. Are you ready? Now I'm about to push some buttons. This is the part of the sermon I enjoy the most. <laughs> I am a, I'm about to challenge you with some tough words. But let me make this very clear. If what I'm about to say angers you in any way or challenges you in any way, uh, I want you to know that I'm going to back up everything I'm about to say with Scripture. And I do that because I don't want your emails. If you don't like what you're hearing, take it up with God. You can argue with God all you want, but I will warn you, you will never win an argument with God. Here's the question. Are you ready for Christ's return? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? In other words, have you accepted that the person or persons that you despise or hate in this world, the person you hold a grudge against, do you accept that that person is loved by God? Do you accept that they are adored by God? And I don't care if they're an atheist or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian. Do you accept that the person you hate or despise in this world is loved and adored by God. For God so loved the world. The world, the world is a big word. And it encompasses things way beyond we often think it should encompass. But the world is the world. The whole world. God loved the whole world. How much did he love the whole world? He sent his, whole son, his own son to die for the world. Those words, love the world, absolutely include the people you despise. The people you fear, the people you hate. Have you accepted that the persons that you despise, fear, or hate, that Jesus went to the cross and died for them. From Scripture, Hebrews chapter 2. But we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Have you come to grips with the reality that the person you hate or despise, Jesus loved and adored enough to go to the cross and die for them? And that if they had been the only person in the world that needed a Savior to die for them, he would have died just for them? The word everyone surely includes people you hate or despise. Have you accepted that putting behind you your hate, your spite, your contempt for others is not a suggestion? It is a command from God. John 13, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also ought to love one another. So my question is, are you ready?
for Christ's return. Have you put away all hatred, enmity, spite? Have you put all that behind you? Have you replaced it with genuine love and concern for all of your neighbors? So how do you really feel about President-elect Trump or Secretary Clinton? How do you really feel about those who voted differently than you? How do you really feel about, oh, I don't know, illegal immigrants? How do you really feel about those of a different color or those of a different religious belief or those who have different views on, say, same-sex marriage? How do you really feel about so-called liberals or so-called conservatives? And the reason I ask how you feel about these things, because in all likelihood, how you feel about these things is also controlling what is in your heart. And do not think for a minute that God doesn't know what is in your heart. Matthew chapter 12. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. That is a warning. It's a warning for our lives, our marriages, our families, our communities, our nation, our world. Are you ready? Are you ready for Christ's return? Are you ready to put all the spite, the fear, the anger, the hatred, whatever dwells in your heart behind you, and truly seek to love those who you probably right now think are pretty unlovable? Folks, all I'm suggesting is this. Just a little reality check. We have some work to do. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do as individuals, don't we? Loving people out there who we really don't want to love. We have a lot of work to do as a nation. We certainly have a lot of work to do as a world. A world that was created by God and for God so that we can truly be ready for Christ's return. And here's the, the rub. I want you to understand this. It all begins with you. You cannot point a finger at anybody else. It all begins with your heart. Because the truth of the matter is, you cannot change anyone else. But you can change yourself. So that's the one you're responsible for. Yourself. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are impossible. Why did I share that with you? Because I think I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, this is impossible. I mean, there's some people out there that are not very nice to us. They're wicked, nasty, horrible, awful people. There are people who have been... Uh, uh, cruel to me or to my family. There are people who have stabbed me in the back. There are, there are all kinds of people out there. How in the world can, not me, how can God expect me, command me to love these individuals? And the truth of the matter is, for human beings, it's impossible. But it's not impossible for God. See, I know you can change. I know I can change. And the reason I know that is because Jesus wants us to change. And he expects us to change. And he commands us to change. Now, I don't want you to think for a minute that I've got this all figured out. I am the poster child for holding resentments on certain people. I mean, I, I don't even like half of you. <laughs> the other half, I, okay, all right. I'm just... No, but, you know, I, I just want you to understand, I'm not preaching down to you. I'm not, pre you know, I, I am preaching at you, but, but I'm really preaching in a mirror here. I'm preaching to myself. These are the things that I struggle with. So I know you do, too. 
So the question is how? Pastor, how is it possible to have such a radical change of heart? Because it's really necessary, because it's part of being prepared for Christ's return. And, and the only way you can do this is, first of all, you, ha- you have to ask. See, and I, most people don't ask. They're very comfortable with their resentments. But if you, if you really feel convicted by the Spirit, then you have to ask. Ask God to give you a new heart. Matthew chapter 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. It begins with asking. And sometimes that's the most difficult step of all, isn't it? But asking isn't enough. The next thing we need to do is we have to put some effort into it. We have to help the Holy Spirit help us transform our heart for God's glory. Luke chapter 6. But to those of you who will listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. What does all of that have in common? All of it is doing something. Okay? So um, let's look at this. Do good to those who hate you. You have to make a conscious decision. You're going to do good to the people you don't like and don't like you. Bless those who curse you. You have to make a conscious decision that you are going to be a blessing to them. This is hard stuff, isn't it? Isn't this really hard stuff? Um, Pray for those who mistreat you. I mean, this is where the rubber really meets the road. How often do you pray for the people you like least in this world? And I mean not pray that God will be a bolt of lightning and blow them out of the world. I mean, pray for them to have a change of heart. Pray for them. I mean, really pray for the people who you hold, you know, your grudges against. And and this one, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. Really what we're talking about here is forgiveness. And, And sometimes what we're talking about is forgiving people who haven't asked for forgiveness. Because it's not about them, it's about us. Well, I, you know, they're not ready, they're not ready. i got to get ready. So if, if I've got to forgive others to get ready, then I guess I better get to work. And I can't, it can't depend on whether or not they say they're sorry. That's just the... Are you ready? Probably not. I'm not. I mean, if this is really what it takes to be ready, I'm not so sure I'm ready. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, um, some of you are now because you really feel convicted, but Pastor, I would really like to be more like the person Jesus wants me to be. Pastor, I I get tired of my excuses. I get tired of seeking to justify my inaction. Uh, But I'm not sure that even if I wanted to change, I'm not sure I could change. I've been this way, Pastor, for so long. I'm not really making excuses. I'm just being realistic. I'm not sure I can start reacting in a different way. I think that in order for me to have that radical kind of change in attitude, I'd have to be born all over again. Oh no, maybe we're on to something. Maybe we're on to something. Maybe we need to be reborn. Maybe we need to be born again. Maybe there are some people in this room who thought they were born again and have just now come to the realization they haven't been born again. Maybe that's all we need to have the heart of Jesus is to be reborn, born again, to see life in a whole new way. I think that's what I need. So let's... Let's agree to pray that God would give us the heart of our Lord 
It's got to start there. Me. I, you know, I'd like to pray that God will give you that heart too. But remember, I can't change you. But I can change me. So this is my prayer. Lord, give me your heart. Now he's going to put me to the test, isn't he? He's going to give me opportunities to practice what I preach. I'm in big trouble this week. I can tell you right now. It always happens. Let us pray that God will give us a heart of our Lord so that any time we feel hatred or animosity toward others for whatever reason, our first will response will be this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then, maybe then, we, you, me, maybe then we'll be ready for Christ's return. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds, one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. Don't throw anything in the direction of the pulpit. <laughs> we will sing our hymn of the day, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying.
brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we ask the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. We give with faith and humility as we are reminded of the incredible gift of eternal life through God's Son. <clears throat> God with us is coming soon. Let us pray that all will receive the promise and spirit that God has blessed us with. Redeemer King, we are truly awestruck by the depth of your love and grace. We are reminded that you died for all people, 
those we love, and those that are hard to love. We know it is your desire that no one be lost by your spirit and our willingness. Help us to set aside any grievances we have so that your outrageous love shines through us. Give each and every one of us a sense of urgency to share your love with those who do not yet claim you as their Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of mercy, your word warns us not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. Move every human heart so that hatreds would cease and the barriers that divide us would crumble. Console all who mourn the loss of loved ones. Protect, comfort, and defend the most vulnerable among us and all those who are desperately in need of your healing touch as we silently name them at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Just and mighty Father, we pray for your mercy to cover our nation, expose and defeat any plans of the enemy, give all in government true servants' hearts that desire to sincerely labor for the common good, compassionate hearts to restore our nation, and forgiving hearts that lift up and encourage one another to work for a country united under your blessing and your guidance. Lord, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and make us ready to receive you as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. Go now and walk in the light of the Lord. Stay alert, for the Lord is near. Put on the armor of light and live openly and honorably. Pray for peace for all of God's people. And may God clothe you in the light of Christ. And may Christ Jesus teach you his way. And may the Holy Spirit keep you alert and prepared for the coming day of the Lord. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord.